Our next uh, session is um, a conversation uh, about evidence, decision-making, and effective early intervention. Uh, and for this conversation, we have Sally Burlington. Uh, Sally is uh, head of policy at the local government association. Um, she leads the LGA's work on social policy issues, bringing a a deep understanding of the national perspective and evidence about policy and practice uh, and what works to improve outcomes in local communities. Um, Sally has had a really uh, distinguished queer career in um, policy making. She started out at the Treasury. She was the first official in the Sure Start unit. Um, she then went on to uh, work in the Social Exclusion Unit uh, to run the Secretariat for the Lions Inquiry into the Future of Local Government uh, before returning to the Department for Education uh, to lead its work on children in care and early intervention from 2007 to 2012. So Sally's really, really well placed to uh, debate these issues with us today. And she will be in conversation with Professor Paul Ramchandani. Uh, Paul is a Lego Professor of Play in Education, Development and Learning at the University of Cambridge. He also works as a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist in the National Health Service. Uh, and was previously a professor of child and adolescent mental health at Imperial College uh, in London. And uh, he's had a distinguished career in academia and his research particularly focuses on mental health. Uh, and he has an interest in the development of play and the prevention of emotional and behavioral problems in the early years of life. And this includes the development on and testing of psychological uh, interventions. So Paul's got a huge amount to bring to this conversation too. So Sally and Paul, uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to hand over to you uh, very shortly. Yeah, I can see you coming up on the screen. Um, there is a Q&A, I think, for this session, uh, and later we'll go into uh, a shadow ministerial speech. So when I'm given the nod, I'll hand over. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, good morning, everybody. Delighted to be here and really excited to be talking to Paul this morning about the use of evidence. Um, I'm going to hand over to Paul straight away to give us um, some thoughts based on his experience. And then I'm uh, really looking forward to having a conversation about the use of evidence in practice in terms of early intervention. So over to you, Paul, next. Thank you very much, Sally, and thank you, Nick, for that introduction. Um, also delighted to be here to have the chance to talk about uh, this important topic. It's a big and challenging topic, evidence, decision making and effective early intervention. And I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about it. It's a topic where simple solutions can sometimes prove seductive, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. And the solutions also look very different and have very different impacts depending on where you're sitting. Now I'll try and be rounded and fair in my approach, but I'm obviously influenced by my experiences, which are both as a producer of research evidence in a research unit, but also as a consumer, as a clinician in the NHS and Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. So trying to make sense of evidence in real time, in real practice as well. I think there are three key components to consider when we're thinking about using evidence to inform practice in early intervention. And I want to consider these three components first and then finish up just with a couple of our ongoing limitations to the effective use of evidence, thinking about those. Um, what is it we're meaning when we're talking about evidence? Uh, there are many definitions. One definition is the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to think about that in terms of consider this as research evidence. So obviously, there are different kinds of evidence, but thinking about research evidence. And that's not just one specific form of study design like randomized controlled trials, but evidence from hopefully well conducted research of all types. And that well conducted bit is really important. There are clearly many other kind of forms of evidence that we have to bring to bear when we make decisions in practice, but the focus here just for the moment is evidence research. So the three components that I'm uh, going to elaborate on a little bit more are firstly valuing evidence and secondly uh, being able to interrogate and interpret the evidence and thirdly being able to get the evidence in a usable and understandable form so that you can integrate it into your decision making. 
So firstly, valuing evidence. As I said, evidence is never the only factor when it comes to a decision. I realise that you all probably know that, but I've seen it come as a shock to a lot of researchers, lots of doctors and many others. But the evidence shows. What do you mean it has to be weighed up with other factors like patient preferences, costs, availability, practicality, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and I know these are some of the range of factors you all have to consider and I have to consider when making decisions about what to do. So when I talk about valuing evidence, I'm talking about having an appreciation for how it fits and what its importance is. It has value because at its best, it can give us independent, reliable and valid findings that can inform decision making. It can tell us what works and as importantly, and maybe even more importantly, it can tell us what doesn't work. And that's something that uh, clinicians, practitioners and advocates for particular types of intervention will rarely do tell us when something doesn't work or when it looks like it doesn't work in certain circumstances. That independence and validity has greater importance, I would argue, in early intervention than, than in almost any other area, in part because the choices that we make and what we provide and what we offer um, to children and families have impacts now, but also in the long term of the lives of those children and families. And also because we're often dealing with some of the most vulnerable people in society who don't get access to a range of options and choice often. Yeah, that if you have if you have wealth or if you have um, opportunity, you can choose. You can pick and choose between different interventions. You can access opportunities and interventions in different ways. But people who don't have access to a range have to take what they what's offered to them. And so it's more critical that the services that we provide are the best that they can possibly be. And evidence is one crucial component in ensuring that. So valuing evidence is really important, I think. And that's even more the case now in times of ongoing hardship and recession. The second thing I mentioned, the second uh, component is being able to interpret or interrogate the evidence. Now, not everyone can train to be a researcher and not everyone should do, thank goodness. But people are going to be able to make better decisions if they can interpret some findings for themselves. We have other ways around this and the What Works centres like the Early Intervention Foundation and bodies like NICE and others can be enormously helpful in appraising the evidence for us. But the degree of research or scientific literacy amongst some of our staff, if we're in a big enough organisation, is something that can be enormously helpful partly because those organisations like EIF can't appraise everything and other interventions come in from left field. You hear about other things and new things and you have to be able to make some judgments about that when sometimes they haven't been appraised by those organisations. We often need more than just a headline in thinking about what that evidence means in our setting. Daniel Moynihan, uh, the US Senator, said everyone's entitled to their own opinion, I'm paraphrasing, but not to their own facts. Um, obviously, there can be different interpretations of research findings and what they mean in different settings, but we need to be sure of the evidence on which we base our decisions. So some degree of being able to do that ourselves empowers staff and empowers organisations. And then thirdly, getting the evidence in a usable and understandable form. And this is where I think as uh, the UK, we probably made the most progress in recent years, initially with organisations like NICE and Healthcare, but now spreading across many areas of practice and it's where I think work went to, well, what works centres are like the Early Intervention Foundation play a key role. It's not their only role of course but I do think it's one of the most valuable roles that they play. Allowing us to see a reliable assessment of the quality of evidence, a quality of research evidence in a particular area and then also usually their considered opinion on a topic and again not everyone will always agree with a particular interpretation but if it's done well the underlying evidence is open to see and open to that kind of challenge. And this is particularly helpful, I think, when it's a big area of research, when it's bringing together a big area of research where there may be a wide range of research studies to weigh and consider. So it's worth what, thinking about what we as practitioners or service providers in such an, what we need is in such an assessment. We have to have confidence in the assessors, so some clear description of what they've done in their assessment is important so that we can critique it. There needs to be a clear assessment of the quality of the underlying evidence. And there are lots of variants on this. You'll, many of you will have seen star counts numbering from 0 to 5 with increasing confidence in the evidence. The plethora of different types isn't always helpful as it can be confusing, but some indication is useful. And then some way of assessing the magnitude of the effect of any intervention or therapy or service arrangement. Um, and this is the one that's often done worst. And we're, we're sometimes 
at its worst, told that something is either evidence-based or not evidence-based. And this hopeless oversimplification drives me nuts, but it's all too prevalent. There aren't any perfect solutions, and it's, it can be complicated to communicate the magnitude of a treatment effect or an intervention effect, but some metrics can help. They need to be understandable to most people and accurate. So these are the three components that I think are critical if we're going to get the evidence we need in the right places for good decisions to be made and effective early intervention to happen. Firstly, valuing evidence, being able to interrogate and interpret that evidence, and being able to get that evidence in a usable and understandable form so we can use it. And just before finishing, I want to just think about some of the limitations of research evidence. It's not the only thing we base decisions on. As I mentioned, we, um, we have a whole range of other aspects that we have to think about, but a couple of issues to consider, which we might come back to in discussion. The first is that an over-reliance on research evidence does sometimes mean that we can miss the voices of those we work with, children and families, because their views aren't always heard in all research, although that is getting better. That means that the views and experiences of children and families are too often missed when it comes to decisions in policy and practice. That's not a limitation unique to research, but it's an important one to consider. And second is the issue of complexity. Um, research can inform decisions, I would argue, even when those decisions are about complex systems, but it can be really challenging to map research findings onto those kind of complex decisions in complex systems that we face. However, evidence can often usefully inform part of that decision, along with all the other usual drivers of decision making, like local preferences, availability of staff, resources, costs, etc. So there are challenges to making evidence accessible in usable and an understandable form, but it's critical if policymakers, service providers and practitioners are going to be able to use it. But if we don't value evidence or if we undervalue evidence, we run the risk of being blown around by whims and fashions and what the loudest voice says. And the most valued, vulnerable children and families that we work with will then get second rate support and intervention and will not do it as well as we could. It's not simple and, it's not, and it does require hard work, but we're looking at the long term benefit of children and so the long term benefit of our society. Of our society. So nothing less really can do or should do. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and a really kind of brilliant summary of such a complex field that, that you are grappling with and so many of us are trying to grapple with. Um, and really helpful, I think, to, to be clear about the limitations of evidence um, and the challenges that we face in trying to interpret it. And I was wondering if you could um, help us through um, understanding what what when you look at the complexity of the evidence available around early intervention and the different aspects that relate to different populations, different types of intervention, the different needs of children in different circumstances and their families, um, how, how would you advise a commissioner who's working in a, a really busy frontline service trying to get the right package available for their local population? What's their best way into the evidence? Um, even, even trawling through the, the brilliant website that the Early Intervention Foundation has, there's so much of it to go on, isn't there? And, um, and we spend a lot of our time at the Local Government Association trying to help local areas make sense of the huge amount of guidance that is available. And you pointed to the fact that sometimes academics disagree and the researchers that we work with will disagree. How, how can we collectively work to a place where we're giving commissioners in those frontline services the best possible advice? <laughs> That's a really difficult question to begin with. Um, Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's, 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 it's complex, isn't it? Are there are some, I mean, there are some shortcuts. There are some shortcuts into it. Um, and um, being linked in with what work centres and what they're producing and having access to what they've produced over time, I think, is enormously important. I'm not a commissioner, so I don't have to struggle with those very mm -hmm. difficult and complex decisions. And, and I realise they're on a different level. There are some similarities with when you're sat with a young person and making decisions with them about treatment. But there are differences because of the, the kind of level and magnitude and different components. Um, so I think having access, I, I mentioned the, the third the third component about having access to research in an in accessible form and one that people can understand, I think is really critical for policymakers. I think having 
um, for commissioners. I think having someone or some people in your organisation who can also appraise the stuff that doesn't get picked up in those reports, I think is critically important. So some evidence function, if you're in a big enough organisation to do that. Um, and then it's trying to think about, well, where does this evidence match up to? And that's the similarity in process, whether you're dealing with one young person or child or dealing with a population. Each time you're taking what the evidence has said from a range of studies, it's hopefully been filtered by someone, so you haven't got to do all of that yourselves. But then you're weighing that up against the different areas of need or the different problems that a young person or a population are bringing. So it's going through that process and weighing up and then matching that up with your population, the similarities and differences and the needs of that particular population, the needs of that particular young person. Um, and it's a slightly different process um, at all times. There are some areas where it's very simple. I think where evidence about a treatment is really clear cut, in most cases that makes it very easy to follow. You should be providing this, you know, if you have. Um, so if I think about me in clinic, if I have a young person with depression um, that I'm seeing, Obviously, every person with depression is different, but there are some fairly clear guidelines about certain kinds of treatment or certain kinds of psychological therapy that you will offer to that person. Um, and so that's the starting point. My overall decision isn't very complicated. There are two or three possibilities, but then it's about matching those on to all. Why do I think that, what do I think might be best for this young person from those options? What's it about their circumstances? What's it about the problems that they're presenting that um, might allow me to think, OK, I think interpersonal problems are more important here than their struggles about schoolwork. And so perhaps that approach might be better. Um, but the evidence, the evidence kind of helps me to frame that decision. And I think that's how I think of it in terms of say I can't speak as a commissioner, mm -hmm. but that's how I would think about it. It allows you to frame some choices that are relatively straightforward, some that are going to be much more complex around the edges. Brilliant. And, and when you talk about assessing the needs of a young person, actually, that has parallels in commissioning, doesn't it? So we talk about doing the needs assessment of our population and working out what interventions might match the needs of that population based on the evidence of what works for those groups yeah. and putting those services in place. But I guess we also have to be realistic that if you look across the suite of every evidence based intervention that's available, and then consider how that matches the needs of any particular local population, there are likely to be gaps yeah. as well. And so is there a role for evidence in informing how we fill the gaps? So we're, we're lucky in the UK in that we've got pretty good universal services and we have health visitors and social workers and, and trained expert professionals across a really wide range who help um, fill in the gaps between evidence-based interventions. And, and I was wondering, could you share your reflections on um, professional training for those different groups and how we use evidence in those kinds of spheres? So th I mean, think professional training, I think, is really, really key because uh, I guess I, I've come increasingly <laughs> to the view um, and maybe this is just me getting older. But um, but your ability to change and your ability to take on new information and the way in which you frame things um, become does become a bit less flexible as you as you go on through your career. Um, and so setting up people training a new to have some of the skills where they can be flexible and adaptable, where they can interrogate for themselves, I think is absolutely critical and something we've perhaps underplayed in our training um, of, of professionals across health, social care, education um, over the years. So it is an opportunity, to, training strikes me as a real, real opportunity to get some of this, um, get some of this into play because um, the, the kind of more traditional models where you gather a particular set of information, a particular set of expertise, um, clearly doesn't work very well for a lifelong career. Um, we need some of that expertise, and I'm not I'm not decrying expertise in, the di in individual professionals, but some of those skills of being able to think about how things change, because this does change. It's one of the other complexities, whether at an individual client or patient level or a commissioning of level, that the evidence evolves and the needs of people that come to you evolve and change. Um, and so we have to be adaptable. Um, and that can sometimes seem overwhelming, I think, but I see that as a, a positive in a positive aspect to be enthusiastic about, that our practice can continue to improve. There are going to be gaps, there are going to be areas where we really struggle to know what's the right thing to do. But again, I see that as a positive challenge. Um, and and with the kind of work that gets done in research and, and say by what work centres and others, 
we are making progress. When I look back 15, 20 years and then look to where we are now, I think there's been a lot, there have been a lot of challenges and lots of things are more challenging. But there's in terms of thinking about the quality of our practice and the quality of practice available to us, I think there's a lot to be excited about as well. And, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed working on over the years is um, is those circumstances when you have multidisciplinary teams together with experts in research or a particular field of study, thinking through together what are the most important priorities? Because when you look at the evidence available on particular issues, there's so much of it that, that working out what's most important for us to do and what are the, the kind of really important truths that we can find threaded through different bits of research and evidence, drawing out those things in a way which um, gets different experts nodding mm. feels really powerful. Um, mm. And sometimes if you can if you can do that and can find the consensus about what works most and best for particular groups, then actually those are really robust things that you can help build a strategy around. Yeah. But I, it, it's sometimes hard to do that where there are a deeply felt um, uh, kind of professionally based understandings of different ways of working. And I don't know whether your transition through the professions that you've been involved in and your, your kind of public health expertise and different forms of expertise, whether you've come across those kinds of disagreements. Um, yeah, and I, I, I mean, I work with different professionals and different uh, from different backgrounds, as I guess many of us do all, all the time and very different perspectives. Um, and I enjoy that. I, I think it's a it is a critical part of our work. And, and you're right when when you can come to a shared decision about things from different perspectives, that is a powerful decision, a more powerful decision. And where we can where we're also incorporating um, kind of feedback and the engagement of, of the children and families that we see again um, and something that makes sense to them. Again, it's a more powerful and probably a longer lasting um, decision. One of the challenges, I think, is that sometimes evidence as a kind of concept gets wrapped up in some of those um, discussions, um, and one and and it, it can really sometimes just be used as a substitute for people saying, "Well, I have expertise." Um, you know, I can come in and say, "Well, the evidence says," <laughs> as a kind of as if it kind of wins the argument. And I think that's very, very, un, very, very unhelpful because it, it's it's rarely black and white. So that the evidence is often evolving. Science changes. Um, research changes and uh, and I think that's a good thing that we uh, are able to then change our minds but it sometimes is used for a substitute for authority and that, that is, a, that is a, a concern and a problem I think. That's a really good point and I've, I've certainly been involved in discussions with government um, where there's been a campaign based on evidence that we should that society, government should do A, B or C because the evidence says so. But sometimes I think people haven't been realistic in lobbying um, based on evidence and um, it, early intervention is a classic example because we know that there's a really strong in principle case mm -hmm. for intervening early and that it has really long term and important benefits. But I think if you overclaim about the benefits of early intervention based on that evidence it can be um it can be disappointing and when you're doing that in a spending review setting actually it's really important to be realistic because we need to ensure that if government's investing in early intervention that we're we're, we're clear what benefits can be delivered and over what time scale mm. and whether or not they can be shown in financial terms or whether they're mainly in outcomes that are harder to measure. Um, so that kind of realism that was playing through your initial remarks feels really important to me, and it's a mistake that I think some of us have fallen into in, in claiming on the basis of evidence in the past. It, it, it is difficult. It's a nuanced argument, isn't it? Because even with the best early intervention services in the world, there are still going to be problems further down the line for some families and some young people. Um, and so we're not going to solve everything, but but we can make an enormous difference. And uh, I th yeah, finding some way of communicating that <laughs> um, to decision makers that there there is enormous power in early intervention, but it's not going to solve everything, and there is nuance. Um, I think it's important. The cost effectiveness argument I think is very difficult and has been oversimplified. I've just spent uh, the last sort of six years. Um, leading a randomised control trial of an early intervention 
where we're looking at the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of it. And it's very, very difficult to demonstrate cost effectiveness of an early intervention because, well, partly because the costs often come much later and partly because our metrics for measuring things that can then map onto the analyses that economists need to do for cost effectiveness models are very difficult. Um, so we, we're, we're building, um, you know, the, the research community and the practice community are building that evidence, but it's there's, there's a long way to go, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, there's, we tend to fall into this language, don't we, about cost effectiveness, um, where economists, and I came as, from, from an economics background originally, economists will look at um, the net benefit. So what we'd like to show is that the net benefit, when you take account of all the outcomes um, generated by an intervention in terms of the, the improvements for children over their lifetimes and then the economic benefits that they generate through their jobs and really long-term lifetime benefits, that when you look at those benefits in the round over that long term, and apply a discount rate, which is a kind of an economic thing to, to, to be able to measure the value of that now, that those benefits outweigh the cost of your investment now. And that depends on so many things, not least that you're really confident in your implementation. And so if you need to be confident that when you implement this intervention that you want to buy now, that the benefits will be shown and that they will endure. And and there's so many slips between those different steps, aren't there? Mm -hmm. So even knowing that you're applying your intervention in a context where it will work mm -hmm. and for a group for whom it will work, um, you still need to be clear that you're able to do it in a way that's consistent with um, all the different aspects of that implementation that, that need to be in place to, mm -hmm. to deliver the benefits. And those things are so difficult to prove. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, de we need to keep trying. I don't want to kind of um, <laughs> depress people about how it's difficult it is. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a challenge that, that getting that nuance, especially. I don't, don't for, want for a second to undercut the importance of early intervention um, because it's, it's critical. And as you say, the case, the case for its potential is really strongly made. And I think it's a very clear one. Um, the challenge is being able to really demonstrate that interventions or things that we do have an effect and and that that is that is more complex than i think people sometimes realize um, but we do have some things we can pin our flag to and some things where we have to say we mm, can't be quite so certain brilliant and i i need to confess i can't see the questions that people are um putting on the chat i don't know if you can paul yeah i can i've got the couple so I'll, <laughs> we can switch around um, <laughs> So I'm going to just try and flip to, so if you bear with me, audience, please. Uh, okay, so the, 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 there are two that have come up with lots and lots, and please do vote if you're voting on, either send your questions or, or vote on the ones that are coming in. So I'm going to go for the one that's got the most thumbs up. Um, so so you might have to answer this one first, Sally, because I'm asking the question. This is a flip of our, <laughs> of our plan. With some complexity, in, with such complexity in health inequalities, the impact of trauma and variance in systems. How can decision makers take evidence from research and apply the findings without diluting the models? As you said, use of voice is critical and then some research is not transferable. So there's a couple of the challenges that we've already been talking about. I don't know if you want to start reflecting on that and I'll have to think about the question. Great, thank you. So um, the, the two kind of initial aspects of the question around health inequalities and trauma, I think are incredibly important. So um, I think there are sessions later today looking at adverse child experiences. So no doubt you'll get into those questions around trauma, early trauma and so on there. I, I would really like to pick up the health inequalities point though, because particularly at the moment following um, the Black Lives Matter campaign and all of our greater awareness of, of all kinds of inequalities, there's something really important about how we use evidence both to understand the nature of um, inequalities as they relate to our own populations and also the ability of evidence to help us target and design support for particular groups so that we're really taking account of um, the inequalities that are affecting them now in our communities and focusing on the things that can make the biggest difference for particular groups. But we shouldn't underestimate how hard that is because we know that in lots of different services, um, 
if you make support available, it will be um, people who aren't the most disadvantaged that come forward to take up those opportunities and those services. And, and actually, you risk making inequalities wider rather than narrowing them. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons that the original Sure Start scheme was made open access, was to encourage everybody to come in, but then to target the support um, on those that needed it the most. But of course, then you've got um, extra costs of providing support to people who don't necessarily need it the most, but you avoid the kind of stigmatising risk of saying, actually, we're going to target it only for, for groups that are suffering disadvantage. So those kinds of dilemmas are very real in terms of how services are designed and delivered right now, but it's never been more important, I think. I'm going to pick up one more quick because we've only got a few more minutes left. So I'm going to pick up one more question and I'm just going to do this in the, on a populist basis when that's got the next place votes, um, which is how as researchers can we make the evidence we generate more useful to commissioners and practitioners? Um, I, can, I can have a stab at that, and, uh, but I guess asking commissioners and practitioners what they need is one way. But um, but I, I think as researchers thinking about how we disseminate our findings, um, we have to think about multiple ways of doing that. So um, I think having a really clear, if, if it's around a particular piece of research, having a really clear dissemination strategy that involves you thinking about who is it that needs to see this? Who do I think needs to see this? How do I reach them? What are the, what are the methods by which they, they take evidence and they consider evidence? And then targeting those ways of disseminating. We, we often as researchers are guilty because of the way that we're valued of publishing in a journal and thinking that's that because that's one of the ways in which we're judged and one of the ways we're, we're valued but that's not the most effective way of reaching most commissioners and practitioners. So thinking about different ways of communicating the research through blogs, through videos, through co communicating with organisations, through not just going to academic conferences but by going to meetings and organisations um, that actually do the practice and do the commissioning and by producing stuff for their journals and their um, and their magazines and ways of disseminating. So I think it's, a, it's about sitting down almost at the start of the research, but certainly long before it's finished and thinking, what is my dissemination strategy for this particular piece of information? And then the more you can talk to commissioners and practitioners, the more you learn about what it is that they need and how they need it. That would be my stab at it. I don't know if you want to add anything. So. Yeah, I know that's brilliant. And and the only thing I'd add is that um, we shouldn't underestimate how hard it is to get the language right for different audiences um, and how important that is because somebody that is leading a major organisation but needs to know about the importance of early intervention, you need to kind of really, really summarise those messages in a way that compresses a huge amount of expertise. Um, and I was wondering, Paul, whether as a final word you might want to just reflect on the importance of play and and messages for parents we haven't really talked about that but it, it, it must be you know the job that you've got now is so important yeah uh, well just to uh, maybe just a very very quick reflection um on, on why i'm doing it because it uh I, I sit in clinic with with young people with difficulties um and it often strikes me as it strikes just many of the audience that actually off oh, I knew we could have got in a little bit earlier we could have we could have prevented some of these um, these difficulties and that's not just about preventing bad things happening to people although preventing bad things happening to people is really important it's also about increasing the positive things that can happen to people and so both of those are necessary I think in improving long-term outcomes and that's why the kind of the fascination with play is one of the things that's ubiquitous across childhood and one of the things children spend a lot of time doing left to their own devices. How do we understand that? How do we understand some of those positive aspects as well as we, we know about the effects of adverse childhood events and we know about the effects of maltreatment? Um, that's really, really important. But it, it's, that, it's that balancing, thinking about a whole approach to childhood and making, making things best for children and families is why I'm drawn into that, that, this area of work. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been a real joy talking to you, Paul. Thank well, likewise, you. Likewise, Sally. <laughs> um, and I've been asked uh, to let everybody know that um, we're going to a short break now and uh, reconvening at 11.30 for the Shadow Minister keynote speech. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.